I'm Encyclopedia Green, and today I am like this 400-year-old Greenland shark, a strange observer, centuries old. I spend my life adrift in an icy ocean, scarcely comprehending the thread of history as it unravels around me. It's a cold, lonely, seemingly endless existence. But it has afforded me the time to learn about a lot of animals, so today I'll be sharing one of my favorites with you. Welcome to my Animal Corner. It's a moonlit night in the Sonoran Desert, and our hero pops out of a hole to survey the world. They may not look like much, but I assure you, that's the face of one of nature's mightiest heroes. Meet Onicomus Tortoise, the werewolf mouse, a maverick who pushes the very limits of what it means to be a mouse in the first place. Nature has tried time and again to get Tori to be more like their timorous cousins, but our hero simply howls in defiance. Behold their mighty voice. Tori's home, the Sonoran Desert of the American Southwest, is an extreme environment. Deserts swing wildly between burning hot and freezing cold. This desert is home to many beautiful dangers, like the Diamondback Rattlesnake, the Mighty Coyote, and the Proud Saguaro Cactus. It takes something extra to thrive out here. How does Tori make their mark? Well, Tori is a predatory mouse. A hunter. And not just any hunter. This mouse hunts monsters. While Tori is only the size of a tangerine, that cry marks territory that can be up to 8 square kilometers. Believe you me, when I'm done, you'll understand why that is barely enough space for this incredible friend. To appreciate how much the werewolf mouse breaks the mold, let's actually consider the mold. What's a mouse? Or rather, what makes a mouse a mouse? Biology as a discipline is very concerned with taxonomy, or basically organizing complex things by giving them special names. Scientific animal names like genus Onychomus species Tortoise are taxonomy, but so are movie genres and the Pokédex. Take Artiodactyla, a family with a stunning number of variations on one essential form, the deer. Artiodactylids have four legs, a strong body, hard hooves, and horns, and by tinkering with that recipe we've gotten everything from classic deer to red deer and blue deer, long deer and strong deer, hot deer and cold deer, big deer and small deer, fluff deer and smooth deer, neck deer and hoof deer, slow deer and fast deer, good deer and trash deer. <clears throat> It's also the order whales are in. Whales are still considered artiodactylids, even though they aren't really deer anymore. Artiodactyla isn't grouped based on what animals look like. It's grouped based on how closely related they are. And amazingly, whales descend from deer-like mammals. Being closely related means they tend to look alike, but when they lose that resemblance, it doesn't mean they leave this group. Mouse is the opposite. It's a softer, more open-ended, and emotionally available taxonomic handle. If you look like a mouse and you act like a mouse, you're a mouse. The American beaver descends from mousy ancestry, but they went rogue, so while they're still rodents, just like whales remain artiodactylids, they aren't mice anymore. Being a mouse is more like having a job than being a family. The term refers to small rodents that are fast breeders, with cute pointed faces, a long tail, and little round ears. Mice are fast, small, and adaptable. They can eat almost anything and live almost anywhere. No matter the environment, there's always room for a few mice to slip in. This part of the tree of life has all of the rodents in it, and mice are scattered all over it. The only order that doesn't include mice is Hystricomorpha, and they have Gundis, Debus, and Tuko Tukus, which all have strong mouse energy. Which brings us back to Tori, a chrysidid mouse in Myomorpha. Being a predator is already the wildest thing a mouse can be, and not content to be merely exceptional, these friends are actually hyper-predators, by which I mean their diet consists mostly of other weaker predators. Tori can eat lots of things, from snakes to lizards to other mice, but they're the best at hunting arthropods, which is pretty much everything with a hard shell and a bunch of legs. This is Centroides sculpturatus, the Arizona bark scorpion. Who's that? It's just the most venomous scorpion in North America. Bark scorpions can put a human being in the hospital. They completely dominate this region. In fact, around here, once the sun goes down, 90% of the scorpions are Centroides. Under the moon's light. And our hero is at their strongest. Incredibly, when Tori and the bark scorpions clash, the scorpion loses every single time. This is the mouse's favorite food. These two animals are about the same size. One of them is a mouse. The other one is a fear tank with a venomous tail and giant knife hands. Can you honestly say you would have guessed the mouse eats the scorpion if I hadn't told you? Well, they do. 
As a hyper predator, Tori has evolved to counter everything in the scorpion's arsenal. The claws? Tori can dodge those with their eyes closed. Literally, Tori fights with their eyes totally closed. Instead of looking, the mouse uses its whiskers like a Jedi and just sort of feels the movement of their prey. And they're fast enough to dodge a rattlesnake strike. Those clock in at around 3 meters per second, which is a little faster than your eye blinks. That wicked tail filled with deadly venom? It only makes the mouse stronger. The way venom works is eye-wateringly complex, but you can think of it this way. A uh, neurotoxin is a venom that activates your pain receptors and then blocks the off switch. Tori has evolved to be more like my apartment, where the light switches sometimes go the opposite way. When the venom hits them, it actually turns the pain off. But like I said, Tori hunts monsters. Plural. See this pinacate beetle? It doesn't look like much until you see its party trick that it's, where it stands on its head and shoots poisonous acid at your face. Tori doesn't care. They just flip the beetle over, shove the dangerous end in the sand, and chow down. The lubber grasshopper, the largest grasshopper in North America, has these scary colorations to ward off predators, which our hero dutifully ignores because, again, they fight with their eyes closed. Thankfully, that's not the lubber grasshopper's only defense. Lubbers also have these giant spiky legs, which can kick super hard. So the mouse breaks those off. Still not impressed? Tori hunts tarantulas, too. Tarantulas are unusually thick and strong, at least compared to most spiders. They're still primarily sneaky snookers who ambush their prey, but their size means they can handle themselves in a fight, and yes, they're among the largest spiders in North America. Also, did you know they have a ranged attack? That characteristic fur that's all over them is actually a collection of needle-like spines which can be launched through the air at your eyes and face. If you've ever stepped on a nettle plant, these are basically that, except a spider's throwing them. Also, technically, tarantulas have seven different kinds of these hairs, and each one is specialized for fighting a different kind of enemy, and yes, that's really interesting, but unfortunately, I'm not here to talk about the intricacies of spider hair. I'm here to talk about a mouse that howls at the moon. And for Tori, this is just another monster on the menu. Which brings us to the baddest of the bad boys, the giant desert centipede. It's twice the size of the werewolf mouse, venomous and covered in armor, and you know our hero eats those. These are the largest centipedes in North America, because of course they are. Tori doesn't get out of bed if it isn't facing off against North America's most something. Using an extremely aggressive strategy I'm dubbing Nanny Nanny boo booing the mouse darts in with a bite and away again to dodge the counter-strike. Eventually the centipede succumbs to its fate. How does this happen? How could a mouse be one of this desert's most dangerous predators? And it is, by the way. Humans tend to think of everything in terms of themselves, but this mouse was here before you, and it does not care that it cannot hurt you, because it's utterly dominant within its own niche. To know how we got here, let's take one more look at the relationship between Tori and their favorite enemy slash food, Sculpey, because the Bark Scorpion owes everything it has to its incredible losing streak. I swear that makes sense. Like a pair of rivals in a shonen anime, these two creatures have become forces of nature by constantly battling for over two million years. That fight was probably pretty even for a while. Venom-resistant mice would live a little longer and in turn eat more scorpions, especially those with weaker venom. That meant the scorpions with stronger venom survived, along with the tougher mice. These two groups bred more and passed on their genes, so the next generation will be more like them. It's basic natural selection. It's also a self-reinforcing loop, a form of co-evolution. When one of them becomes stronger, that puts direct pressure on the other. The werewolf mouse is the reason the bark scorpion is so dangerous, and the bark scorpion is the reason the werewolf mouse is so successful. Then, one day, the contest was just over. Tori had officially won. They aren't resistant to this scorpion's venom. They aren't even immune to it. Their superpower is not only better than simple immunity, it's better than modern human medical technology. They changed the game, Hamilton style. The mouse's natural painkiller is straight up better than anesthetic medicine like lidocaine, which blocks pain along with muscular control. It's also better than general painkillers, even strong ones like morphine, because it doesn't mess with the brain or other senses. That would be no good for an animal that's currently in the middle of a fight to the death. Both classes of drugs are too broad, too clunky. If we return to our light switch metaphor, they turn your lights off by tripping your breaker. Venom, on the other hand, tends to be sophisticated and targeted. It evolved over millions of years to bond to a very specific part of your pain-feeling system in order to hurt as much as it can. So when Tori transmogrifies it into a painkiller, the result is just as sophisticated. It turns off the pain without affecting the mouse's other senses. To be clear, this isn't a general venom immunity. It's specific to this one scorpion. Tarantulas and centipedes are also venomous, and we don't know if the mouse can resist their venom or not. Tarantula venom is neurotoxic, like a scorpion, so there might be some overlap there. But centipede venom is on another level. 
In a paper attempting to explain how centipedes can regularly kill prey five times their size, they named the key component of the venom spooky toxin. It does what scorpion do, while also attacking the lungs, heart, brain, and muscles at the same time. While a werewolf mouse is basically cheating when it hunts bark scorpions, it has to fight fair against these other monsters, and it still wins. It doesn't need to be immune to the venom. The spider's chalicerids and the scorpion's forcibles, you know, their fangs, are large enough to inflict a mortal wound on the mouse anyway. Faced with these, the only option is to not get bit. So the question must be asked, is this even a mouse? Remember, the term refers to animals that share characteristics. Tori's absolutely in the genus Onychomus and the family Crocididae, that's not what I'm asking. Despite their appearance and their ancestry, Tori's place in the ecosystem is so fundamentally and extremely unmousy that I think it earns them an asterisk, at least. They've broken the mold, soared beyond the limits of other mice. Like all great predators, the very presence defines the landscape of their home. Tori's ultimate secret isn't their immunity to venom or their Jedi whiskers or even their incredible reflexes. It's their tenacity. Research shows that this mouse approaches every hunt with maximum aggression no matter what. They treat all of their prey the same way. If it's a deadly centipede or a defenseless cricket, they go all in. And I think that's the lesson Tori can teach all of us. When you want something, put your whole self into it. Be like Tori. Hunt monsters, howl at the moon, and bring fear to the non-localized hemolymphic vascular systems of the metaphorical scorpions in your own life, whatever form they may take. Thanks for swinging by. If you have an animal you'd like to see featured in the Animal Corner, leave a comment below and subscribe for new episodes of Animal Corner each month. Also, likes and subscriptions are one of the only things that will sate the mouse's endless hunger. Oh, cripes, where did it go?